physiology now. It's the actual volume of blood that's flowing through a vessel or an organ or whatever we're going to be talking about. And it's measured in milliliters per, per minute. It's relatively constant at rest. So it doesn't slow down or speed up. If you're at rest, there's enough momentum there that I actually keep the same blood flow throughout all your organs. Okay? Now, resistance. I'm going to show you how to put all these three things together in a moment. Resistance is anything that's going to oppose the blood flow or slow it down. Simple thing that you can see resistance. You uh, take a fire hydrant over here. You've got a hose that comes out. Water's coming out the other end. If I take my hand and I start pressing down on that, that hose, I'm putting resistance on there. It's going to affect the blood flow. It's going to affect the blood pressure. That's the way you've got to look at this. Okay? So it's any friction to the blood that's going to oppose the blood flow in one way or another. We have three important sources of resistance. Two of them we really can't change. One of them we can. The viscosity of blood, how thick the blood is, that will actually increase the resistance. So if you have that, what we talked about, polycythemia, which is an increase of red blood cells, that's going to increase the viscosity, the thickness of the blood. That's going to add more resistance. You put more cars on the highway, it's going to resist the cars moving forward and cause traffic. We can't really change that on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It can change over days if you're dehydrated or something, or blood doping, which we'll talk about another time. But that's something we really can't change on a moment to moment. The total length of the blood vessel also puts more resistance. If you have something like this, and this is your blood vessel, you've got some resistance that's happening over here. But if we made the blood vessel longer, then the resistance will be added. There's more resistance to a longer blood vessel than there is to a shorter blood vessel. Does that make sense? If blood is going to go from here, and now in a smaller area here for a longer amount of time, there's going to be more resistance there. But well, we can't change the length of our blood vessels, right? I mean, you can't really stretch them. I mean, over a matter of years and decades from a toddler to an adult, sure. But it's not going to happen on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. However, the diameter of blood vessel, that does change. That's something we can change. Well, we can't, but our brain is going to change. And that will change the resistance or lack of resistance in blood flow. This is a blood vessel, a cross section of a blood vessel. And it's filled with blood. That same volume of blood, if we dilate the blood vessel bigger, then that same amount of blood would only fill maybe half the area which means that your resistance will decrease. Does that make sense? As opposed of taking that blood vessel and you make it smaller, with that same amount of blood that's in there, you're going to increase that resistance. It's filled up. So increasing the radius of the blood vessel will decrease the resistance. If we decrease the diameter or radius of that blood vessel, you will increase the resistance. It's indirectly proportionate. 
See how you're using this? And our autonomic nervous system will control that. So just to reiterate, the factors that relatively do not change is going to be viscosity, the thickness of the blood. We can't change that on a moment-to-moment -moment thing. But when you're sick or something's happening, sure. If you're dehydrated, that means there's going to be less water there, which means that the red blood cells is going to be more red blood cells than there is water. The blood's going to get thicker, is it not? Think about it. If you make pudding, and you have powder, and you have milk, if you just have powder with a little bit of milk, meaning like it's dehydrated, isn't it going to be thicker? That's how you have to think. Okay? And you increase red blood cells, as in polycythemia, you're putting more powder in that pudding. It's going to be thicker. And the length, as I said, the longer the length of the blood vessel, the more resistance there. We can't change that. That's pretty obvious. But the factor that can be changed is going to be the diameter of the blood vessel. Okay? And it changes frequently and significantly. It is going to alter the peripheral resistance. PR is peripheral resistance. If the radius is doubled, the resistance is less. Does that make sense? You see it up here. And if if it decreases, then the resistance goes up. And the blood vessel that controls most of all this is going to be the arterioles. The arterioles is our major blood vessel that is going to, con that is going to contribute towards vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Hint, hint. Arterioles are the ones that are mainly doing this. Okay? Atherosclerosis. Think about this. If we have a blood vessel that's like this, and I have an atherosclerotic plaque that is going to build up here, isn't that theoretically making the diameters decrease? So therefore, atherosclerosis does what to resistance? Increase or decrease? Increase resistance because the diameter is theoretically getting smaller. That's why atherosclerosis will lead to more resistance, which will lead to high blood pressure. So you put these things together. Blood flow, peripheral resistance, and blood pressure. Blood pressure is directly proportional to blood flow i.e., when you increase the blood flow, then the blood pressure will increase. Think about it. The faster the blood is going, the more pressure it's going to be in that blood vessel. That makes sense, right? And vice versa. If the blood flow goes down, then the blood pressure goes down too. But the peripheral resistance is indirectly proportional. The blood flow. As the blood, or, I'm sorry, as the peripheral resistance increases, the blood flow will decrease. Think about it. If my resistance increases here, the blood flow is going to go slower. Think of it like um, I don't want to use that example. But does that make sense? It's going to go slower in that blood vessel because the resistance is there. Okay? I'm going to use that example later on. So we have systemic blood pressure. Alright? And it's a pumping action of the heart and it's going to generate blood pressures. Going from a high blood pressure to a low blood pressure. Old news common sense kind of thing, 
right? And it results from the flow when the flow is opposed by resistance. There's something that's going to push it forward, then that's what's going to happen, okay? So the highest pressure is going to be at the aorta. Are we in agreement with that? Right? Because the blood just came from the left ventricle. So the highest pressure is going to be at the aorta. And by the time you get to the right atrium, or back to the right atrium, it's extremely low. And it's virtually like zero. All right? It's like five millimeters of mercury. But it's like zero. So keep in mind, as we said before, blood pressure is not zero millimeters of mercury down by the feet. If it was, it would stay by the feet. So it's got to be pushed up. There's mechanisms to push that up, as I showed you before. It's not the valves, it's the muscles of the legs that'll do that. All right? And the steepest change of uh, blood pressure would occur in the arterioles. And I'll show you a little graph to show you this. Like I said, blood volume, 65%, two-thirds of your blood is going to be in your veins. And that's why we have more veins than we do arteries. Now the cross-sectional area, when we're dealing with total cross-sectional area, when we decrease the diameter of blood vessel, the total, total cross-sectional area increases. So I'll show you what I mean. If this is your aorta over here, and then it branches into many different things, Um, what's another one here? And these are your blood, this is your red blood cells over here. The cross sectional area over here is pretty large. This is pretty small. But look what's happening here surface area. The only place that this red blood cell is exposed to the, to the blood vessel here, the wall of the blood vessel, is this area here, and also up here. But these, this, the surface areas are not even touching there. So these, these two over here, and the other side of these two, can't have oxygen come off, because it's not touching the blood vessel wall. Does that make sense? But look what happens when you gradually go here. So have one blood vessel entering each one of these. Eventually, we get the capillary. Now we've increased our surface area tremendously. Each one of these is <coughs> exposing its oxygen and carbon dioxide and gas, gas exchange can occur here. So the surface area, although it's a big blood vessel, it is rather huge a surface area. However, compared to one blood vessel up here, but when you add up these blood vessels here, we have a lot more surface area when you compare it to this. So I'm talking about the total surface area increases. Does that make sense? Because I'm decreasing diameter of each one of these blood vessels. If you decrease the diameter of the blood vessel, then the blood flow or the velocity will decrease. And this is the example I was going to give you. When you have on the highway, 93 or whatever, and you have four lanes over there, you're going pretty fast. Well, maybe Route 93 might not be a good example of that. There's just more traffic than anything I've seen. But you get the picture. There's four lanes. You should be going pretty fast at 80, you know, 60, 70 miles per hour. Not that I'm encouraging that, but you can. But when you get off on an exit with only one lane, are you still doing 65 miles per hour? You can't. It slows down. So what I'm saying here, if you decrease the diameter of blood vessel, 
you're going to also decrease the velocity of the blood. Now these red blood cells are going to be moving much slower in capillaries compared to the artery or the arteriole. Okay? And I just explained it over here, much like cars being able to stay on traffic going from highway to an exit. Does that make sense on that? Okay? This is kind of like you're rearranging the blood vessels. I'm just rearranging this to this so I get maximum surface area. If I take these four blocks on here, the only places I could actually touch is those surface areas. But there's a lot of hidden areas over there that I don't, it's not exposed and I can't touch. But if we just take these four blocks, or eight blocks rather, we could then rearrange them and now there's more surface area that I could actually touch. Or take them stack it like this, there's a lot more surface area that I can actually touch. It's just rearranging it and then doing it that way. Does that make sense? Okay? So you gotta understand what surface area is. Surface area is anything that you can actually touch or being exposed. Now taking this, I could increase the surface area without even changing the volume of this. Watch. Crack. I did not change the volume of this, but I did create two new surface areas. Do you see? So do understand, if you have it in A and B1, make sure you understand what surface area is. Because when we get into the, reprodu or the uh, respiratory system, we're going to talk more about that. And then there's something else called surface tension, which is totally something totally different. All right, but that's what surface area is. Now, let me show you this graph. You got to be able to use this. It's very easy to understand. So let me show you what, how to orient you on here. This is basically your your uh, blood or your blood vessel system in your artery. Or, I'm sorry, aorta is over here. Arterioles are over here. Capillaries over here, venules, and then veins. Right? Straightforward. This corresponds with all this. So if you follow this, it's going all this. So the aorta is all this. Your capillaries would be all this. Does that make sense how you're seeing this? Alright, so what's happening here? The area is going to be very low, it's like 0 to 5 millimeters cubed in the aorta. Well, watch what happens as we get into the capillaries. It's astronomical. Your surface area is huge, which is what I'm trying to show you in this diagram of what I drew up here. And then it gradually goes back down to the inferior vena cava, which is basically the same surface area as the aorta. When we deal with velocity, it's going to be pretty pronounced at the aorta. But gradually, like you're taking a bowling ball, and gradually as you throw it down, like it loses its velocity, it loses its momentum. And that's why we see this big drop. And when you get down to capillaries, it's going to be extremely slow. Going on to those exits I was telling you about from the highway. Is that clear? Okay. It does pick up a little bit more when you get into the veins because we have to get the blood back up to the heart. It doesn't go up as much as it saw with the aorta. But it is going to get up, and that's where we show those mechanisms with, with the valves of the veins and the leg muscles to try and push things back up. Over here is blood pressure. And the pressure is going to be pretty great when you get to the aorta, or when you're at the aorta. And where the aorta is, between systole and diastole, it's going to go up and down, up and down, during filling or relaxation, relaxation and contraction, relaxation, contraction. And the aorta is going to actually sustain and, and take and feel that. That's why we're seeing it going up and down, up and down. But by the time you get into the capillaries and definitely the veins, it loses that, that up and down motion from systole and diastole. This is the closest to the heart. So of course it's going to be able to pick up with that up and down motion. But gradually, as you see, the blood pressure will go all the way down. By the time you get back to the right atrium, it's like zero. Okay? Questions about this? Everything I explained is also written here, too.
Questions about how to read this thing? Okay. So arterial blood pressure affected by two factors. Elasticity. The recoiling action. When in the aorta, if a big bolus of blood goes in there, it's going to expand the aorta, but it needs to recoil. And the recoiling action is going to push the blood forward. Can't go backwards because you've got the aortic valve there. And it won't go back into the heart. So the recoiling action, the elasticity of that recoiling action is going to push it forward. The amount of blood that's forced in it. Well, it depends. If there's going to be a big bolus of blood there, then that's going to add to blood pressure in there. If it's a little bit, the stroke volume is very little, that's going to add very little blood pressure to the aorta. Does that make sense? So the volume of blood, as in the stroke volume, is that big, and also the elasticity, how well those that aorta can actually recoil back down. Okay? So like I said, the most elastic arteries have to be closest to the heart, because that's the ones that are going to withstand the greatest pressure. It becomes an up and down thing that I just showed you, this pulsatile, where it actually feels the systolic pressure, and it feels the diastolic pressure. That's why we saw it go up and down, up and down. Okay? Alright, some other terms here. We mentioned a few already. Systolic pressure. Systolic pressure is the pressure exerted on the arterial walls during ventricular contraction. That makes sense. Di diastolic pressure is the pressure when the heart's relaxed. Then we have another word here called pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. So if you have a blood pressure of 140, uh, which is systolic pressure, 140 over 100. 100 is telling you diastolic pressure. Then what's the pulse pressure? 140 over 100. What's the pulse pressure? It's the difference between the systolic pressure and diastolic. This is first grade math. 140 minus 100. 40. Right? That's the pulse pressure. You guys are just tired, right? Say that's the reason. All right. That's it. That's all you have to do to do the pulse pressure. Very easy. Okay? Then we have something called the mean arterial pressure, which is the most significant thing, but you need to know about these other pressures to get to a mean arterial pressure. What is the arterial blood pressure in your whole body, what, but what's the average blood pressure throughout your whole body? Because it's different in different areas. That's the mean arterial pressure. We have to calculate that. So, deals with the peripheral resistance. Right? You've got more resistance, it's going to increase your blood pressure. You have the cardiac reserve, which is the difference between the cardiac output at rest versus the cardiac output under extreme conditions. Exercise or something, right? So here's the mean arterial pressure formula. All right? The average blood pressure in, in an individual. And it's the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. But that's sometimes difficult to figure out. I think you guys can figure out how to figure out the cardiac output, right? What's the formula for cardiac output? Good. Stroke volume versus heart rate, right? Got a lot to study. All right? So you can figure that out. But it's hard to figure out the peripheral resistance. So we have other ways, there's other formulas to figure out the, the uh, mean arterial pressure. And this is actually the easier one, and there's a good emphasis on this one. This is the one you're going to have to memorize. This emphasizes that the diastole, or the diastolic pressure, is more of a contribution towards the mean arterial pressure than systole. <coughs> you would think that systole has more of a uh, significance. It does, but only about one-third. But diastole, diastole is more significant. So look at this. 
The mean arterial pressure is a diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. So systolic pressure minus a diastolic pressure is the pulse pressure, right? So you rearrange it, it's the same thing. Diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. That's it. This is emphasizing that diastolic pressure has more contribution to the map, not like this third over here. You see it? Now, how do you use this, and what's the significance here? Okay. Let me give you an example of normal, and I'll give you an example of abnormal. And this is the stuff you got to really take home with you in any field that you're going into. All right? You've always heard people get in their blood, what's your blood pressure, what's your blood pressure? Well, now I'm going to show you the significance of what this is. So let me show you two examples, and I'll show you the significance. Let's say a blood pressure is 120 over 80, which, by the way, seven years ago, uh, this is not normal anymore. All right? They realized about seven years ago, they made this now with all the American Medical Associations and stuff, that people with 120 over 80 end up developing high blood pressure earlier than other people. So this is what we call pre-hypertension. All right? The blood pressure you want is 115 over 75. Does that make a difference? It does. Okay? But no more are we using 120 over 80 as normal. Okay? But I'm putting that up there just to give you an example of one. So 120 over 80. So you can figure out the pulse pressure. What's the pulse pressure of this person? What is it? 40. All right. You just do 120 minus 80, you get 40. Makes sense, okay? You guys can handle that. Keep in mind, on my next exam, there's no calculator. I'm going to give you stuff that's pretty easy to do, or I assume you have this. First or second grade, all right? This is easy math. All right, so you know the pulse pressure. Now, we got to figure out what the math is. Easy, just plug in things, all right? Diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. So, 80 plus 40 divided by 3. All right, fourth grade math, okay? Not even long division, all right? So, you get 80 plus about 13, okay? Which gives you a mean arterial pressure of 93 millimeters of mercury. What that means is that, on average, in your body, your blood pressure is about 93 millimeters of mercury throughout your whole body. Certain parts are a little higher, certain parts are a little lower, but on average, 93. That means your blood vessels in your body can withstand a blood pressure, on average, as 93. That's what that means. Okay? Now, let's throw in a different blood pressure. Let's say someone has a blood pressure of 160 over 100. Now keep in mind, your blood vessels can withstand a blood pressure on a healthy person at 93 millimeters of mercury. Okay? Like your tires in your, on your car, they can usually withstand a, a pressure of like 30 or 35. What happens if you put 80? So we do the same thing, pulse pressure, 160 minus 100, what is it? 60, okay, good, so it's 60. Then you just plug in this, the diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. What's one-third of the pulse pressure? 20, okay, <coughs> see how easy math is? All right, so you're going to get that, which means that your mean arterial pressure is now 120 millimeters of mercury. Big difference here. Now, if you have high blood pressure and it's just because you had my test, fine. But you're walking around 160 over 80. Now your blood vessels are not made to withstand 120 millimeters of mercury. It should only withstand about 92, 93 millimeters of mercury. You're putting more stress on those blood vessels. They're going to burst. That's why high blood pressure can lead to strokes. The stroke, the blood vessels I was explaining about in the circle of Willis, they don't withstand blood pressures this high. They will burst. And that means less blood flow going to that part of the brain, and you'll have a stroke. 
All right? So that's the significance there. Questions about that? You can manage these formulas, but it's a significance you need to really understand too. So these are factors that affect the mean arterial pressure. You could do these all on your own. Flow charts like this are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, all right, you just follow the arrows and all these different things in here. If you increase the blood volume, how does that increase the mean arterial pressure? If you understand the stuff we've been talking about already at home, then go into here and see if you can go step by step and see if you can understand it. Okay, it's pretty self-explanatory once you understand the tools. Now, capillary blood pressure ranges between 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury, okay? Low capillary, pressure, low capillary pressure is what you want. You don't want high. When you have it at low, they're going to be able to force the blood in a certain way to get into the tissues. At high blood pressures in capillaries, they become fragile and they start bursting. Venous blood pressure is steady. And it changes little throughout the whole cardiac cycle. Again, think about the pressure. You cut an artery, it shoots off because of the blood pressure. You cut a vein, it trickles down. You can see that. Okay? And these are places that we're going to talk about in the lab, but you can take pulses. You already know that you can take the superficial temporal pulse that's over here. You can take a pulse in the axillary area. The, you can also take it in a brachial, you can take it in the groin, you can take it on behind the knee, you can take it on your foot. There's a lot of pulse taking places. You need to know where those are, but in order to know them, you need to know the blood vessels, where they are in your body. And that's what lab is going to do. So how do you control blood pressure? Well, it's a cooperation of the heart, blood vessels, and kidney, and it's the supervision of the brain that's going to do all this wonderful autonomic nervous system working on. So the main factors influencing blood pressure are cardiac output, how much blood is going into that, those blood vessels, and the peripheral resistance, as we talked about, and the volume, which is really the cardiac output. Okay. So you could put it together as blood pressure is the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance and rearrange it because if you know the blood pressure, which you just did the math, and you know cardiac output, you can then figure out what peripheral resistance is if you reverse those things, right? Simple algebra. You know how to calculate cardiac output, you know how to calculate the mean arterial pressure. So then, through process of elimination, algebra, you can figure out the peripheral resistance. Does that make sense? All of you is how to take algebra in order to get into A and P1. That's basic algebra. Sound good? All right. All right. Now, short-term control of blood pressure. We have baroreceptor reflexes. We talked about this briefly. But baroreceptors are receptors that sense pressure, like a barometer, right? A barometer is sensing atmospheric pressure. Well, we have baroreceptors that are found in our carotid arteries and also in our aortic arch that sense high blood pressure. When it does, it sends a message to the brain, and the brain says, oh, that's too high, we're going to vasodilate all your blood vessels throughout your whole body to make your blood pressure go down. You see that? Questions on that? Now, let me also tell you this, too. You have two carotids over here. And what happens here, if I was going to press on those, I'm actually pressing on the baroreceptors. If I'm going to press on that, it sends a message to the brain saying that there's pressure on there, which means the pressure goes up, sends a message throughout my whole body to vasodilate. I am not going to massage both of these for you right now. What will happen to me if I start rubbing these really hard? What's going to happen to my body? Don't do this at home. It's not worth it. It's going to pass out. I'm not pressing on the trachea so air can't get in. I'm pressing on the carotid here. We call it a bilateral, because it's happening on both sides, a bilateral carotid massage. I start rubbing this. Right? When would I 
do this to someone? If I'm in my office and someone's blood pressure is like 200 over 160, and unfortunately, with people with high blood pressure, even blood pressure like that, do you know how they actually feel? Fine. They don't even realize it. So this is a incidental kind of finding. That's why we do blood pressures on everybody that come in there. Even though you think it's fine, it might not be. And we see 200 over 160. My concern is, I don't care why that person came into my office, I am not going to have them stroke out. I don't care what they're here. They're here to check the baby. So I don't care. That person is not going to stroke out of my office. So I'm going to rub that really, really hard and have someone call up an ambulance to get her out of here and bring it to the emergency room and let them figure out you know, what medications to give and figure out why the blood pressure is that high. You see? That's a bilateral carotid massage. Do it on one side, your brain is smart enough to realize, well, it's only happened on one side, so it must be something like artificial. Do it on both sides is a different story. Okay, does that make sense? What a bilateral carotid massage is. Okay. Chemoreceptor reflexes, all right? A change in the O2 or carbon dioxide um, or the pH levels will also alter the pH. We'll learn more about this when we get into the respiratory system, okay? But those chemoreceptor re uh, receptors are also found in the same place as the baroreceptors are located, okay? We could also have a central nervous system uh, ischemic response. In other words, if the blood flow is decreased to the brain, that means you're going to have less, uh, well, either the blood flow or you have too much carbon dioxide or the pH <coughs> changes, low pH, acidic blood going there, it's also going to change the blood pressure, okay? So these are just places that you're seeing. Here's the carotid areas for the uh, baroreceptors that you would see up here. And also in the green area here, you'll see some baroreceptors in the aortic arch also. Okay, that's where it's showing all right, and this is just showing you the reflexes of what's happening with the baroreceptors, okay? And the chemoreceptor is similar too, okay? Again, do this on your own. There are flows over here. If you increase the blood pressure, arteries are stretched, barometer, or, uh, baroreceptors are firing. How does that affect and make the blood pressure go low? So it's these kind of flow charts that put things together. Not going to go over it. You guys can do this on your own, but it's reiterating everything I said over here. Okay? Now, the long term control of blood pressure um, are these things here. Something called renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Oh, aldosterone. You can't get away from hormones. All right? And we talked about renin too. This mechanism, I'll show you briefly what happens with that. Vasopressin, also known as ADH. What does that do to blood pressure if that's increased? If you increase ADH, what happens to blood pressure? It goes up, right? But it takes, hormones take time, minutes to hours for that to happen. We also have the atrial natriuretic factor. They also call it the atrial natriuretic peptide. They also call it the atrial natriuretic, your favorite word, hormone, right? If that increases, what does that do to blood pressure? It decreases it, right? The atrial, natri the atrial natriatic hormone is, comes out of the atria of the heart. When low, I'm sorry, when high blood pressure reaches the heart, it's the atria of the heart sends that and release ANH, this atrial natriatic hormone. And that's going to decrease aldosterone, which means it's going to decrease blood pressure. Okay. This fluid shift mechanism I'm going to do with you next time we meet. All right. This gets pretty heavy, and we'll deal with that afterwards. And then also stress relaxation response, which stress does to you. So let me show you briefly about what this renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is. You can put your pencils down. Pretty easy to understand. Busy slide. You're going to see it quite often for the rest of A and P2 also, and I'll show you why. First off, here's your kidney. I know it doesn't look like a kidney, but you'll understand what that is. It's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, the JGA. But 
the kidney is going to sense a decrease in blood pressure. When it does, the kidney is going to release renin. Renin enters the blood, so it acts like a hormone. But renin also acts as an enzyme because something called angiotensinogen comes from the liver and spits into the bloodstream. And it's floating there as an inactive state. In the presence of renin, angiotensinogen gets converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is still an intermediate. It's really not an active thing. So we have something that comes out of our lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme, also known as ACE. This comes out, and in the presence of angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2. Now this is fully activated. And angiotensin 2 is going to go to the adrenal cortex, to secrete aldosterone. Aldosterone goes into the bloodstream, targets the kidney. What does it do to sodium? What does aldosterone do to sodium in the kidney? It reabsorbs it. When the sodium gets reabsorbed, what's going to follow the sodium into the bloodstream? Water. When you increase water into the bloodstream, what happens to the blood volume? Goes up. When you increase the blood volume, what does that do to blood pressure? Goes up. Kidney senses the decrease in blood pressure. These things happen. Aldosterone gets released, and it makes the blood pressure go up. This is a great final exam question. It's dealing with the kidney the liver, digestive, the lungs from respiratory, you got this puts it all together. You ever hear of a medication called an ACE inhibitor? Well, you don't need to know what it is right now, but you can figure out what it does. An ACE inhibitor is going to block this. If it blocks ACE from coming out from the lungs, you're not going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. If angiotensin 2 is not made, is your blood pressure going to go up? No. So guess what an ACE inhibitor is actually treat a treatment for? High blood pressure. That's how it works. That's why, that's why I better doggone understand this thing, because when you get into nursing, wherever you're going to take pharmacology, they're going to ask you that. They're going to expect you to know this whole thing. See how to use it? Okay, but we're going to revisit this next time when we get into the lungs, when we get into the digestive system, when we get into the kidney, it's going to come back. But that's called a renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Okay, and how the kidney takes the decreased arterial pressure and turns it into an increased blood pressure, the things I've explained to you and putting together endocrinology with ADH and uh, aldosterone will put this all in perspective for you. Again, do these kind of flow charts for yourselves to make sure you're on top of things. Okay? They're just reiterations of the stuff that we've been talking about. Like I said, atrial natriatic hormone, also known as atrial natriatic peptide, or just the factor of it, when the heart atria increase in blood pressure, it releases NNH, which means that you're, it's going to decrease aldosterone, which means it's going to decrease blood pressure. Okay? Fluid shift, we're going to save that for another time. All right? That's, we've got to deal with different pressures. I don't want to get into it. And like you saw, stress relaxation, if your blood volume increases, we can adjust the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. You increase the blood volume, and by vasodilation occurs, blood pressure goes down. Okay? And clinical applications, you can put all this together, figure out what happens with your body when you learn about all this. What happens when you go through exercise, or when you have, let's say, your arm gets cut off and blood is coming out, you're hemorrhaging. So, you can do this on your own, right? I mean, hemorrhage means 
decrease in blood volume, decrease in venous return, all the way down. This is why your arterial blood pressure goes down step by step. You can visualize it this way, or you can visualize it this way when you're actually throwing in the renin-angiotensin uh, aldosterone mechanism with the viral receptors. Because you can't isolate each thing. Your whole body works together. You've got to understand how this all works. And then with uh, exercise, you can do this flow chart to show you how that comes in. Okay? Questions on that? All right. Let me just, this is light and fluffy. It's only about four slides. And then uh, I'll do some uh, other things with you. All right? Just important physiological concepts, which I kind of already told you about. The regulation of blood flow, it's really important that you understand everything on the next slide um, and see how each factor comes together. I wouldn't say memorize it, but once you feel like you understand everything up to this point, then you should be able to, excuse me, you should be able to put all this together. Okay? It's a busy slide. I'm not going to go over it because it's going to go over your head if you don't know this stuff. But when you're ready, then put it all together. It's very busy, but it's a flow chart. And you can see how everything we talked about and how it actually starts or goes. Okay? Now, the cardiac output distribution. If you have... 5,000 milliliters coming out of the heart, the left heart, where does all that blood go? If I have 5,000 milliliters coming out of the left heart, going to all of my organs, how much is coming out of my right heart to just the lung? It has to be the same amount. It has to be. You can't have 3,000 milliliters going to the lungs and 5,000 coming out of the left heart. It wouldn't even make sense. It's a closed circuit. So what's emphasized to you is how big those lungs are. They could take in 5,000 milliliters a minute. Or 5,000, or let's say 5 liters. So that was my question. With each cycle, the amount of blood going into your aorta has to equal the same amount going to your lungs at that same time. I know it doesn't sound right, but it has to. Just think about it, right? It has to. Okay? So the blood's fate, once it leaks, so you know all the blood, where's all the blood going from, from the right ventricle? Where's it all going to? What's the organ it goes to? The lungs. But, what you also need to understand is the percentage of the blood going to certain organs from the left heart. You need to know where those go. There's five, there's five liters or 5,000 milliliters that's leaving the left heart. So what's the percentage of that going to the brain? What's the percentage that's going to the kidneys? You should know that. And that's what this is over here. 30% of that blood from the left ventricle goes to the skeletal muscle. 25% goes to your GI system, your digestive system. 20% goes to the kidneys. One-fifth of that goes to the kidneys. 15% goes to the brain, and 5% goes to the skin. You should know those. All right? And 5% goes to the heart, right? To the coronary system. So this is just, in a picture form, if... The right heart puts its 5,000 milliliters into the lungs. The left heart has 5,000 milliliters that goes to all different parts here. Got to understand that. 